Good morning, everyone, and welcome to PJR's webinar on root cause analysis and systemic corrective action. My name is Shannon Craddock, and I'm the Programs and Accreditations Manager at PJR, and I'm glad to have you here participating. Appreciate your time, and I hope you can find this webinar helpful. All participants are in a listen-only mode, and that's to ensure sound quality. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to address all of them at the end of the lecture portion of today's webinar. Just type them into the chat feature, and I will try to get you as many questions as I can. In addition, I encourage you to check out our website, www.pjr.com, for information on upcoming webinars. It's also here where you'll be able to access a copy of the slides of today's webinar as well as a digital recording. So today we're going to talk about why we're doing this, why we selected this particular topic. We'll also take apart the audit finding and talk about why it's so important to write a finding correctly. Um, it's essentially the start to good problem solving. We'll then talk about actions taken to correct containment and corrections. We'll talk about root cause analysis and the why technique. We'll talk about actions taken to prevent recurrence or corrective actions, and actions taken to prevent occurrence of issues in the first place or preventive actions. We'll also talk about verification activities, what steps you need to take to ensure that any actions taken are indeed effective. So first, a little bit about um, why we selected this topic. Uh, we want your organization to improve. There should be a strong correlation between third-party audit performance and an organization's quality record with your customers. So if you've got a very strong quality record with your customers, on time, on quality delivery, your audit results should correlate. Um, you should have a relatively strong management system um, with, with few NCRs. In addition, um, if you have a problematic record with your customers, um, on time delivery, on time quality performance is suffering, um, that should be indicative in your audit results. The third-party auditor should be picking up on that. So the purpose of a third-party third management systems audit isn't to convince the auditor to write as few nonconformities as possible. Um, it's to accept valid nonconformities and then take systemic corrective action for each and every nonconformity that's found. And that's how we start to see the strong correlation. So let's talk about a well-written audit finding. It should have three distinct parts. First, the statement of nonconformity. Second, objective evidence. And three, a clear citation of a very specific requirement not being met. Audit findings that do not contain these three distinct parts should not be written by PGR auditors. And you clients are empowered here. Don't accept them. Kick them back to the PGR auditor if they're not written correctly. At the closing meeting to help the auditor to rewrite them. I will personally back you on this. If the auditor documents an opportunity for improvement, um, these should exist only as statements or recommendations. Um, because they're not a nonconformity, there will not be a citation of a requirement that's not being met. If a requirement should be cited, cited then we're looking at a nonconformity that's being inappropriately classified as an opportunity for improvement. So let's talk about some common pitfalls with well-written nonconformities. The statement of nonconformity, um, and we'll, we'll often see that the nonconformity or statement recorded is not the problem, but a symptom of the problem. The problem must be expressed as an issue with the system. If the problem is expressed in terms of a person or incident, it's at the symptom stage. And I see both internal and third-party auditors make this mistake. So it's important to get to the true problem, the systemic issue, or the problem-solving efforts will not be effective. 
fixing symptoms will not stop the issue from occurring. In addition, a well-written nonconformity should stand the test of time. Your organization should be able to, to archive the nonconformity and then pull it up years later and understand exactly what the issue was. So let's illustrate this with some examples. Here are some examples of poorly written nonconformities. First um, example, there was no training matrix for the first shift operator running job 9954 indicating competence to run that job. Now on the surface, this seems to be a good nonconformity. We've got a lot of detail here. Um, we know it's what particular job. We know it's a first shift operator. However, this is a symptom, not the true problem, not the true systemic issue. We are confusing objective evidence with the statement of nonconformity. A better way to write this, the system for recording employee training and competence is not completely effective. There's the word system right in the statement of nonconformity, and that's what you want to do. You want to get the problem solver to focus their issues on the systemic issue. <coughs> and the particular symptom that was observed that allows us to make this statement, well, the training matrix for the first shift operator running job 9954 <coughs> indicating competence to run that job. <coughs> and then we cite a requirement, in this case, ISO 9001-622E. And you'll note that we're citing this out as far as we can to the letter suffix. We're not just citing 6.2. So a well-written finding. The system for recording employee training and competence is not completely effective. <coughs> We're focusing on the systemic issue and not on a specific incident or symptom. A poor finding, another example. Quality auditor in the blue cell was using an uncontrolled form to record the results of first piece inspection. Again, this is a symptom and not the true systemic issue or problem. Here again, we're confusing objective evidence with the statement of nonconformity. A better way to write this, the document control system isn't completely effective. The symptom that we observe that allows us to make this statement should be written in the objective evidence. Quality audit in a blue cell using an uncontrolled form. And again, we're citing the most specific requirement, 9K2008. 423D. <coughs> I apologize. I, I do have a bit of a cold, and I thought I'd be able to get through this with no issues. So a better way to write this issue, the document control system is not completely effective. We're focusing on the systemic issue and not upon a specific incident or symptom. So when you're reviewing a nonconformity, whether it's written by a PGR auditor, an internal auditor, or a customer, from a customer audit, you want to ask the, the questions. Are we distinguishing between the symptoms and the real problem? Does the final statement of nonconformity focus on a systemic issue as opposed to just a single incident person or, or uncalibrated gauge, for example? And are there data to assist in understanding the extent of the issue? PJR has an internal document that requires all auditors to document any non-fulfillment of a requirement as such. So we don't allow freebies, so to speak, to put it in layman's terms. If an auditor encounters an NCR, we expect them to write, them, write it up. If we don't, it's really no benefit to you. All you're going to do then is implement a correction, but you will never do true problem solving to prevent recurrence. This contributes to the diminishment of the integrity of management system certification and doesn't allow us to help you achieve um, 
better on time on quality performance with your customers. So it's our expectation that all nonconformities written by PGR auditors shall be written with those three parts, statement of finding, objective evidence to assist in understanding, and a clear citation of the requirement not being met. Nonconformities that are presented to you that do not have these three parts should be rejected by the auditee. Let's talk about actions taken to correct, um, often called corrections or containment actions. And these are actions taken with respect to the symptom or incident. They're incident-specific actions. They're very important and should be taken immediately to stop the symptoms. Um, actions taken to correct typically take two forms. Uh, we calibrated the gauge that was found to be in an uncalibrated state. Well, we controlled the form that was in an uncontrolled state. The second type is adding a layer of inspection to catch any further occurrence. However, inspection adds cost to the system, not value. And later we will learn that once corrective action is implemented, then costly added inspections can be removed from the system. You should also be performing an extent analysis, and we often see that this is missed. And it's a common reason we reject corrections from an auditee when they reply to nonconformities written by PGR auditors. So if our auditor writes up a finding and they cite two gauges that were found in an uncalibrated state, or their calibration status was unknown, the expectation is not that you just go and get those two gauges checked and validated and recalibrated. The expectation is that you look at all the gauges and make sure that it is just those two. So you're trying to determine the extent of the problem. And we expect specific detail in your response. We looked at all 140 gauges and it was only these two, or it was 10 more, and tell us what you did when you discovered that issue. Furthermore, if any product was inspected with these gauges, what did you do with that product? How did you val validate its conformity? I made the statement earlier that containment actions or corrections are very specific. So in our first example, the training matrix for the first shift operator running job 9954 was updated to reflect his competency, that is his ability to run the job unsupervised, or all copies of the uncontrolled form being used in the blue cell were destroyed. Okay, let's move on to root cause analysis. <coughs> the most common pitfall with root cause analysis is that organizations will also re often restate the incident um, as, as their root cause, and this is not acceptable. For example, the organization failed to update the training matrix for the operator running job 9954. And I laugh because we know this. We told you this. Why is it that you failed to update the matrix? Or the quality auditor in the blue cell, you didn't use the correct form. Again, our auditor knows this. They told you this. Why is it that the quality auditor in the blue cell was using an uncontrolled form? We'll also see some examples of corrective action reports that give containment actions for the root cause, and this is also not acceptable. So if you've dozed off at your desk or are checking your email or working on something else, um, this is what you want to tune into. I think this is the most important slide in the entire presentation. A good root cause analysis answers the following question. What in the system failed such that the problem occurred? What in the system failed such that the problem occurred? We're focusing on the system and not the incident. Some problems may have multiple root causes, and it also may happen that some problems have several possible root causes. If the root cause cannot be discovered, 
then all potential root causes require corrective action. If the root cause has been found, you should be able to turn the problem on and then off again, just like a light switch. If the problem cannot be turned on and off at will, then the root cause has probably not been found. At this point in the presentation, I usually share an anecdote when I used to work in um, automotive, um, and I was responsible for a Tier 1 supplier's um, various management systems. And we had an issue where we had a dual cavity tool, left hand, right hand parts. <coughs> Very straightforward shoot and ship part, but there was a left hand and a right hand. What the auditor had to do was take the parts dropped by the robot onto a conveyor, identify the left hand part and put it in the left hand box, take the right hand part and put it in the right hand box. Unfortunately, operators were mixing the hands and putting them into inappropriate boxes. And we discovered, or we, we did our root cause analysis, and we thought that the, the, the reason that the system was failing and creating the problem, remember, what in the system has failed such that the problem occurred? Well, our thought as to what in the system has failed was the poor manufacturing cell configuration. The left-hand packout box was directly in front of the operator. The right-hand packout box was directly behind the left-hand packout box. And this was because the manufacturing cell's configuration was very narrow. It would make more sense that once the robot got the parts that were dropped by the robot onto the conveyor, that the left-hand box would be on the left-hand side of the individual's body, and the right-hand box would be on the right-hand side of the individual's body. But it was not and that was due to space constraints. So what we did is we reconfigured the manufacturing cell. We spent tens of thousands of dollars moving that manufacturing press as well as the two adjacent so that we could reconfigure the manufacturing cell. Now the left-hand packout box was on the left-hand side of the operator's body and the right-hand packout box was on the right-hand side of the operator's body. We thought we had it, but we discovered that we could not turn the problem off like a light switch. We were still mixing hands. Right hand parts were ending up in left hand boxes and vice versa. We couldn't find the true root, we didn't have the true root cause because we could not turn the problem off like a light switch. More on this later. There are a lot of different techniques for root cause analysis. Is is not the fishbone diagram, Ishikawa. We're going to talk today about the Y technique, um, often called the 5Y, um, but sometimes you can get to the true root cause in more or less Ys. Okay, so let's go to our first example. Remember the finding the system for recording employee training and competence is not completely effective. And the symptom that allowed us to make this statement, there was no training matrix for the first shift operator running job 9954, indicating competence to run that job. In the Y technique, you, you begin the process of asking why over and over again in order to get to the root cause. So why was there no training matrix? Well. The first shift operator failed to update the training matrix as required by the first of the month. Okay, well, why didn't the first shift supervisor follow this requirement? <coughs> well, before the end of the previous month, the HR manager would email the training matrix template to all the supervisors, but for some reason, this email didn't happen this month. Why? Well, the HR manager left the company before the end of the month, and her replacement didn't email the template. Well, why didn't her replacement email the template? Well, the procedure for training didn't include a requirement to prompt the new HR manager to email the template to all department supervisors. Now, at this point, could you ask why again? Maybe, maybe not. And, and granted, I, I will admit that this is somewhat subjective. But what you want to do is make sure that you, as the management representative, aren't doing a why analysis by yourself. 
You've got all interested parties, all, all functions in the organization affected by the finding, inputting into the why analysis um, to ensure that you've gone far enough. And when you have 10 people that say, yeah, we've gone far enough, you've got a lot more confidence in it if it's just one of you saying, well, I think I've gone far enough. Okay, let's look at our second example. You'll remember the document control system not completely effective, and that's because we saw a quality auditor in the blue cell using an uncontrolled form to record the results of first piece inspection. Okay, why was that auditor using an uncontrolled form? Well, controlled hard copies of the first piece inspection form had all been used up in the blue cell. So the quality auditor resulted to an uncontrolled form. Well, why, didn't they, why didn't they just print some more? The quality auditor in the blue cell was not aware that when no hard copies of the particular form were available, that he or she could access it through the company database. Well, why weren't they aware of this? Well, they didn't even have a username and password to access the database. Well, why not? HR didn't have a policy to ensure all new hires are granted a system username and password. Again, have we gone far enough? If you've got enough people in the room that feel you've gone far enough, you can have some confidence. Please don't attempt to answer nonconformities on your own. I often joke and say, as, as the mother of a three-year-old, um, you know, how do I know I've gone far enough? And when you get to the point where, you know, you've got a, a, a toddler saying, why, mama, why? And you get to the point where you say, because I'm the mom and I said so. Um, when you're going through these and you get to that point, because I'm the mom and I said so, um, it, it's just because, you know, we've gone far enough. Um, you can have some confidence that you've taken the why analysis as far as it needs to go. Some things we will not accept for root cause. Oversight. We misunderstood the requirement. Um, and to be honest, I've got a little bit of, of tolerance for this. On an initial audit of stage two, you can misunderstand the requirement. On surveillance audit 18, you should be understanding the requirements. So in a the very, very early stage of a given certification program, you can misunderstand requirements. And it may be only during the, the registration audit that the light bulb goes off and you say, that's what that meant. That's fine. Your corrective action should then focus on getting training and understanding in the requirements across your organization. I forgot um, a couple of my personal favorites. Another ISO 9001 blunder, our consultant messed up, or human error. Okay, moving on to corrective actions. Corrective actions should address the root cause. They therefore should address the question, and again, the most important statement in the entire presentation, what in the system failed such that the problem occurred? A common pitfall is that many organizations give containment actions or corrections instead of corrective actions. These are very, very different types of actions. Um, this is not acceptable. So in the, the anecdote I gave about the left-hand and right-hand parts getting mixed up, the correction in that situation would be making sure everything shipped to our customer was packed correctly, adding a layer of inspection at the customer's site, and doing 100% containment. That's the containment action. The corrective action is the action taken to address the root cause, and I'll share that with you in just a few minutes. Not only should corrective actions address the system, but they should be irreversible. They should involve a change in the system. And training by itself is generally not a system change. Incident-specific actions or corrections containment actions are not irreversible. In the automotive industry, corrective actions should prompt, prompt changes to the design and process schemas and the control plan and may require a new PPAP. <coughs> there should be at least one corrective action for each root cause that was identified, and subsequent data should show that the problem has 100% disappeared, or that you can turn it, you've turned it off like a light switch. So let's go through our examples. 
The first finding was the system for recording employee training and competence was not completely effective. Our corrective action. The procedure was updated to include a requirement for the HR manager to email the training matrix template to all supervisors for updating before the end of a month. And the new HR manager was trained on this requirement, and she added an automatic reminder to her outlook to perform this task. So there is a training component to this corrective action. You'll mention the prior slide just talked about this. But there's also system changes. We've changed a procedure, and outlook reminders were added. So there is a system change to go along with that training. The important question is, does the corrective action address the root cause? Let's go back to the root cause. The procedure for training didn't include a requirement to prompt the new HR manager to email the template to supervisors. And now it does. The procedure has been updated. So this corrective action addresses the root cause. It is appropriate. Second example, document control system not completely effective. Our corrective action, the new hire work instruction, was revised to include a requirement to grant new hires a username and password. As needed, all HR personnel were trained on this change. Again, there's a training component, but it's not the only thing that was done. There's a system change, a revision to a work instruction. Does this corrective action address the root cause? Remember, our corrective actions must address the root cause. HR didn't have a policy to ensure all new hires are granted a username and password. That was our root cause. And now they do. We revise the new hire work instruction. So this corrective action does address the root cause. Okay, before I move on to preventive actions, let's go back to the anecdote I was sharing about um, my previous life working in an automotive tier one supplier left-hand parts were being packed in the right-hand pack-out boxes and vice versa. You'll remember we convened a team, we did our root cause analysis, and we thought our root cause was the narrow manufacturing cell configuration that allowed a illogical um, arrangement of the pack-out boxes. So we moved some presses, we reconfigured the pack-out boxes, but the operators were still mixing the parts. So, because we weren't able to turn the problem off like a light switch, we knew we didn't have the true root cause. So again, we convened a problem-solving team, and this time we invited a material handler from the third shift. And this young man said something very wise. If it was impossible to pack a left-hand part into a right-hand box, wouldn't the problem go away? And sure enough, we worked with a packaging engineer to reconfigure the pack-out boxes, and when it was impossible to put a left-hand part in a right-hand box, we had identified the true root cause, and we turned the problem off like a light switch. Okay, moving on to preventive actions. Preventive actions answer one of the two questions. What other systems might have the same root cause present, and what systems could I have had in place that would have prevented this from happening? A common pitfall with preventive actions is that many cars put corrective actions for preventive actions. Remember, preventive actions address the future, not the past. So what could still happen, not what did happen. Preventive actions address the system, not incidents. They involve changing the system to prevent future problems. Keep in mind that preventive actions are not identified only because of nonconformities. Management system standards such as 9001 or AS9100 or TS16949 require preventive action as a proactive process with inputs from multiple sources. Some of these sources may be near miss reports, 5S programs, lean initiatives, employee or customer suggestions, P 
Carrie Johnson auditors opportunities for improvement. They should not only result because of system nonconformities. So what we're looking is that you have a proactive system to consider preventive action opportunities. Now you certainly don't have to implement everything as a preventive action, but we need to see that you're considering all possible inputs as potential preventive actions. Failure to do that will lead to a nonconformity. Failure to have preventive actions does not necessarily lead to a nonconformity as long as you can prove you're considering preventive action opportunities and documenting why they may not be appropriate preventive actions for your organization. And that's an important point. I've seen many organizations get written up, and the PGR auditor will write, there were no preventive actions. Now that in and itself is not a finding. If you can prove, maybe through management review minutes or a continual improvement team meeting minutes, that you've been considering opportunities for preventive action, but you're not implementing them for whatever reason, you're making a business case not to, for example, then you're meeting the requirement of the standard, a proactive process with inputs from multiple sources. <coughs> Finally, let's talk about verification. This is a critical and often not performed step in the problem solving process. Many car forms do not have places for verification at the appropriate locations. So the following needs to be verified. That any containment or corrections have been taken, that proper root cause analysis has been performed, and that the problem can be turned off, and that irreversible systemic corrective actions addressing the root cause have been implemented, and if your containment or correction was that added layer of inspection, that that has been removed where appropriate. So in my example, we knew that once we had re-engineered the pack-out boxes, make, making it impossible to pack a right-hand part in the left-hand box, we no longer needed our operators on site at General Motors um, sorting through boxes of parts and certifying them we could take that added layer of, of correction out. And then opportunities for preventive action have been considered and taken as appropriate. Keep in mind that corrective actions, while we want them to be irreversible, can be reversible. When you change a system, it means you're changing how work is performed. And change is difficult. Systems and people tend to return to where they feel comfortable. So you want to continue to verify actions even after you get positive results on the first verification. Don't be in a rush to close nonconformities just to get them green on your corrective action log. Like a, like a good wine, you need to let things age and, and make sure that that corrective action stands the test of time and you continue to get positive results on your verification efforts. Our auditors do not accept root cause correction and corrective action while they're on site. Um, we feel that this doesn't lead to discipline problem solving, it leads to quick fixes. Our auditors do, however, verify the effectiveness of previous corrective actions from the prior audit while they're on site. I do want to acknowledge the IAOB for partial side content. Thank you. And I will now open the chat feature to any questions or comments that you may have, and I'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, these slides will be available for download, as I said before, on our website, www.pgr.com. Um, Noel is asking, what if the finding is one out of a hundred samples? Do you consider this a systemic finding? I, I don't think that, that the issue is a major one, Noel, um, but it's a finding and it should be written as such. Um, and the intent is that you fix the system that allowed that one escape.
Um, getting some specific questions about where on our website, www.pgr.com. Um, on the home page on the right hand side, you'll see um, webinars, future webinars, and previously recorded webinars. Please click there. The PGR advisory is the intended audience is our auditors, um, and auditors will share with clients the advisories as they see fit. They're not available for client download. Just waiting for more questions, folks. John, I don't know what you mean by foolproofing. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm thinking you mean error, mistake proofing, um, and that's um, a, a both. An, that could be an acceptable corrective or preventive action. If by foolproofing you mean error proofing something, um, adding sensors to look for clips, for example, on a part. Victoria has a, a, a really insightful question, um, and I'm going to read it verbatim. If human error is not considered a root cause, how do we address failures of proficiency samples? So we've, we've got, I guess, in a proficiency test, Victoria, you've got, um, you, you have a situation where you're not getting the desired results. Um, so that, that could be due to a number of reasons. It could be due to um, the, the testing or, or evaluation protocol not being clear, the equipment itself not being calibrated. Um, so you've got to, if, if, a, if a human makes a mistake, you've got to go further and ask, why did the human make the mistake? Um, so the desired result wasn't achieved. Um, you, you obviously think, okay, this person isn't proficient, but why aren't they pro proficient? Is the methodology flawed or not clear? Um, is the equipment that they use problematic? Um, are they using the, the equipment inappropriately, in which case perhaps the, the, the training they were provided wasn't clear? I hope that addresses your question. Someone's saying, are you saying that preventive actions should not be listed as corrective actions? Um, not sure what you mean by that question, Tanya. I just want to make myself very clear. When you're doing, if there's a nonconformity, and you're doing your problem solving, you implement a containment and a correction, go through your root cause analysis, implement a corrective action to address the root cause, that corrective action report should be an input to your preventive action system. Will it always result in a preventive action? No, but it should be an input to the preventive action system. Thirteen forty-five, David. The check for effectiveness is 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 what we mean by verification, um, making sure that the implemented corrective actions were indeed effective. Um, Jasmine is acting, asking, how does an auditee reject a PGR finding if it doesn't contain all three parts? Ideally, you'll catch this at the closing meeting. Um, look your auditor in the, lead up in the eye and, and tell them he didn't do a very good job. 
um, and, and ask that they rewrite the finding. And if the auditor gives you um, problems or issues, um, pick up the phone and call me and I will speak directly with the auditor and, and we'll get the nonconformity written um, appropriately. Um, accredited management system certification services are cheap. You should pay for well-written nonconformities. Um, Mike's asking, how do you solve or take corrective action against an operator that does not follow the written instruction? Okay, you've got to, the, the problem solving should focus on why is that operator not following the written instruction? And before you say that, that it's a bad operator or a bad employee, you want to make sure that the instruction is as clear as possible, that they understand it. Um, maybe ask them to take you through it. Um, maybe ask them to explain it to you in, in your own words. Um, systems have the issues, not, not the people is the point that I'm trying to make. So you need to rule out that you, you, you in fact don't have a person who, who just is being defiant to be defiant. <coughs> and if you determine that that's what you have, then you, you, you need to decide what you're going to do about that employee. But the assumption is not that the operator is making an error. The system's allowing him to make an error. So you've got to figure out, is the work instruction that they're following not clear? Um, and, and rule out those things before you make that statement. Um, Joe Collins, I'm not understanding your question about documentation for equipment, if you could provide clarification. Um, question on human error from Stephen. You have 100 staff who turn in monthly reports to you. Um, every few months the same person forgets. All of their 99 do not. Is it human error? Well, it's, it's a system that's allowing that. So you need to make a system change, Stephen. Um, and a good solution would be an Outlook reminder. That's an example of a system change. Um, Maria is asking that I show the pages on verification again, please. I will pull those up. Great question from Sam. Um, to submit a corrective action to PGR for a write-up that was issued, does the verification have to be complete or can it have a timeline to complete the verification before PGR accepts the corrective action? Um, Sam, I'm going to expand on this. Um, and Aerospace and TS16949 have their own rules, but in general we will accept corrective action plans for all minor nonconformities on ISO 9001, 14,000, 1345 audits. For major nonconformities, we need to see that the corrective action has been fully implemented. Now, it doesn't have to be verified because you may keep it open for six months to verify that it continues to be effective and that people and systems aren't returning to where they feel comfortable. Um, for aerospace, before we issue a new cert or a recertification, all actions, even for minor nonconformities, have to be fully implemented. Okay, so Joe's asking a question. Um, if you wanted a site that can't produce documentation related to calibration of their equipment and they can't provide a corrective action response, um, 
Is it reasonable to request a corrective and preventive action to correct the entire documentation system and later review the effectiveness of the system over time? To Joe, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, but this is, to me is a fundamental failure. An organization that can't produce documentation relating to calibration, which is a required record, would result in a major nonconformity against their calibration system. Major nonconformity against 7.6. Um, and uh, this is such a serious issue, it might lead to them not getting recommended for certification or certification being suspended. Um, Bobby has a question. Any suggestions when determining the cause is difficult, complicated circuit boards, or various components that could have failed, but you can't tell what it was? Um, Bobby, I'm certainly not a circuit board expert, um, uh, but the expectation is, is that you go through that and, and you're, you're testing everything to figure out what the failure is um, in order to prevent recurrence. I'm going to wait a few more minutes to see if we get any other questions. So I need to see if there's any more questions. Please type them into the chat feature and I'll be trying to answer as many as possible. Again, copies of the PowerPoint presentation and a recording of the slide are available on our website, www.pgr.com. I'm going to wait another minute or two to see if there's any other questions. Great question from Gail Brown. How should the corrective action report be shown as an input to the preventive action system? Um, I think the easiest way for an organization to show this, scale is in their management review minutes and under the section that requires them to discuss corrective and preventive actions, they would say, you know, on our last PGR audit, we had three opportunities for improvement um, and two nonconformities. We're going to go through these one by one and decide if any preventive actions should result. Maybe we can apply the corrective action to a related process. Maybe we can apply it to another plant or a sister company, etc. cetera. 
Um, Mike's asking if you have an isolated finding with corrective action, does it require follow-up or verification? 100% yes. Uh, Rick's asking me to give an example of reversing a verification. If you could provide cl uh, clarification on that, I don't know what you mean. Um, what you want to do when you're verifying effectiveness of a corrective action, Rick, is make sure that you're getting the desired results every time. So if you go in 48 hours later, chances are that <clears throat> people still remember the training they were given. They're still following the procedure. Um, the gauges are still calibrated. Things are good at 48 hours, but what about at the two-month mark or the six-month mark? So you just want to continue verifying the corrective action to ensure that you're getting positive results. So if at the three-week mark you're getting verification efforts that, le that are yielding undesirable results, people and systems are reverting back to where they're comfortable and doing things wrong, this is a problem. Um, and you need to go back into the problem solving, look at some retraining and looking to make sure your corrective action is truly effective and that you've identified the right root cause. <coughs> Um, Dijon is asking for a major finding, what's the time allocated to provide the corrective action? Again, it's standard specific, usually between 30 to 60 days. Some of the more tighter time frames being for aerospace. Um, but usually requiring full implementation, meaning actions implemented, not a plan to, to implement them in the future, having them implemented within 60 days. Presentation can be downloaded from our website, www.pjr.com. Um, on the right-hand side, about halfway down the home page, look for uh, webinars, and you can click on future webinars to see a schedule or previously recorded webinars. I'm just going to wait for another minute to see if there's any other questions. Any questions you may have, type them into the chat feature. Okay, folks, thank you for attending today. I hope you found the webinar helpful. Um, I apologize for the, the quality of my voice, and I hope you were able to understand me with this cold. 
Um, please check our website for information on future webinars and to access a digital recording and the slides from this webinar. Thank you and have a great week.